I'd like to thank the pastor for this opportunity to minister. It truly is an honor and a privilege any time you can stand behind the sacred text. But Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1. And the Bible reads, As ye of the Lord reign in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Read that one more time. As ye of the Lord reign in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. If you would actually study out cultivation in Israel and Palestinian region, we would discover that there are two rains throughout the year that occur. There is the former rain, which occurs in the spring, and the latter rain, which occurs in the fall. In Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24, this verse brings it out um, in tremendous detail, or at least lists them all. Jeremiah 5, 24, Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain both the former and the latter in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. There are two rainy seasons in Israel, and they are sandwiched at the ends. And right in the middle is a time of a hot, dry summer. In the springtime, when the Lord sends the rain, they can have the harvest, and that's when they get their grain, their wheat, all of the staples of their diet. The latter rain in the fall brings forth the fruit, the olives for the oil, and so forth. But both seasons are extremely important. The fruit doesn't fall and can't be harvested in the spring, and the grains and the wheat cannot be harvested in the fall. Each one of them have their own season. But each season requires its own amount of rain because if there's not enough rain in the spring, the harvest and the wheat, they're not going to be as plentiful. And when the summertime comes, it's going to be scorching, it's going to hot, and it's going to dry them off and kill them all off. In the former season, the rain has to come from the fall for so the trees may grow and bring forth their blossoms, that the olive trees would bring forth their olives, that they could be gathered and harvested so they could make their anointing oil for the temple, that they may prepare the oil for the candle, own candlestick. Because without the rain, they cannot collect that harvest. There are two seasons, and right in the middle is a dry hot summer. You know, the same thing is true in our own lives. We need to have our soil saturated with the rain of the Holy Ghost. Tonight I'm preaching on we need to saturate the soil in our lives. If we go to James chapter 5 and verse 17, the Bible states, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And we would go back to the time of Elijah. We know that there, there was a time when it was nothing but dry. There was no rain that came down for three and a half years. Why? Because one man sent up prayers to heaven that it might not rain. And he had like passions like you and like passions like me. But he knew what it was to get a hold of God. And he said, God, I need you to show up the heavens that it should not rain. And therefore, it did not rain for a span of three and a half years. And during this time, we find that God had a showdown with the, uh, with the prophets of Baal. And he, Elijah brought the prophets to the top of Mount Carmel there. And he said, why don't you call on your God? And I will call on my God. And they sat up there, and they called on their God, and they called on their God, and they called on their God. But there was no answer. But you know what? What Elijah got up, and he said, prepare the sacrifice. Built the altar. And when it was all done, and it was all dressed, he said, you know what? That item that is scarce, that liquid that is few and far in between, load up 12 barrels, because we're showing God that we're going to make a sacrifice tonight. 
life and we are going to be from the utmost core of our being and that thing that is precious, that thing that is pure, dump it upon the sacrifice and make sure you dig a chance down about it. And the Bible states that the Israelites took 12 barrels, one barrel for each tribe, and they saturated the sacrifice and it can smell all that water, ran down the sacrifice, ran down all those blocks of stone that built, composed the altar. It made a trench round about the altar and Elijah got up after he was done mocking and making fun of the prophets of Baal and he said, God, that is God. Call down fire. And he called down fire. How did Elijah call down fire? Well, if we look at the verses in the Bible, it wasn't a large prayer at all, but rather it was all by any means. Because if any other one of us would want to get a hold of God, if something was eating at us and we said, I need to get serious with God, we would get down on our knees and we would cry out for hours, maybe days, going throughout our daily life, God, I need you to move. But Elijah, with a prayer that consists of about two or three verses, Call down fire from heaven. What well, does that tell me? That tells me we look in that a man of God that knew what it was to get a hold of God. He sat down and he got a hold of God. He saturated that oil, that soil with supplication. He saturated with prayer. You know what we need tonight? We need a bunch of praying men, a bunch of bunch of praying women that knows what it is to get down on our knees and saturate the soil with prayers. We are in a church world that doesn't know what it is to pray. But Elijah was obviously a man of prayer because God answered by fire with not a long prayer, but a short prayer. We find that after this, that he's on the run from Jezebel and he goes by the brook Cherith. And he goes to a little bit farther on a 40 day journey and he goes hiding in some cave from Jezebel. And he thinks he's all alone. But you know what? He listens for God. And a wind comes by and an earthquake comes by. But he recognizes that God was not in him. What does that tell me? That is a man that knows what it is to saturate the soil and prayer to that he's so much so that he knows the voice of God. But when God comes by there's still a small voice, he's not still looking for a sign like a lot of the people in the church world today are. He's not looking for a wonder. But he recognizes that it is God, the voice of God Almighty. How can a man know what it, the voice of God sounds like? The only way a man can know what the voice of God sounds like is when he has saturated the soil in prayer, when he has spent time with God, when he has communed with God. Oh, this man that was with like passion as you and I are, he knew what it was to saturate the soil in prayer. And because of that, heaven answered if we get a little bit closer to our own time frame, in 1865, there was a man born by the name of John Hyde. You know, many people throughout the church world may not recognize this name unless they knew what it was to get a hold of God and went day and say, I want to know what it is to pray. But this man was known as the Apostle of Prayer. He was a missionary to India, and he got invited to conferences not to preach, not to teach, but because they knew he was a man of prayer and knew how to get a hold of God. It is said that he would go on and pray for 36 hours straight. He was a man that would sit down on the bench and say, God, give me one soul today. Would you just give me one soul today? Let me win one soul for your kingdom. And then soon he was winning one soul. And then finally he would get to the point he would say, God, grant me two souls today that I may win for your kingdom. And it would, the numbers would go on and increase as time went on. But why would they increase? Because John Hyde knew what it was to get a hold of God. He knew what it was to saturate the soil with supplication. And because of that, heaven looked down and they said they saw that he was fit to get a hold of God. He was a man that saturated the soil so much with prayer that one boy at one conference said, John Hyde, may I come and pray with you today? He said, sure. And as they went to prayer, they went into this room, this dark room, and John Hyde shut the door from behind and not even up been into the prayer. The little boy makes mention that he was afraid to reach out his head because there in the middle of the room, it just felt 
felt like such a presence that if he would reach out, he was afraid he was going to touch something that would startle him, something physical. Why is that? Because John Hyde was a man that knew what it was to saturate the soil in prayer. He knew what it was to get a hold of God. He knew what it was to grab a hold of the horns of the altar and pray and pray and pray. And when it felt like he could pray no more, he prayed some more. What is he doing? He was saturating the soil in prayer. He was building his relationship with God. Oh, but one thing you need to realize here was while John Todd was known as the Apostle of Prayer, before John Hyde became the famous minister that he was, there was a daddy back home that was praying, that was a Presbyterian minister. God, won't you raise up missionaries in our lifetime? God, won't you raise up somebody to take the gospel to the heathen? God, won't you raise up somebody in our town, within the United States perhaps, to take the gospel message somewhere else? Lord, won't you raise up laborers to work in your vineyard? Because we know that there's coming a time when no man will work, and the night is upon us. But Lord, send us missionaries while it's still daylight. And within his lifetime, the Lord raised up his very own son. And he said, you know what? I am going to honor that prayer that the Presbyterian minister would make. And I am going to raise up his son to have a desire for the mission field. I'm going to raise up his son to send out forth missionaries because his father saturated the soil in prayer for missionaries. I am going to honor it. And John, God raised up John praying high, another minister that would saturate the soil in prayer. And we would go a little bit farther. In May 1934, he said, that Billy Graham was just a lanky young teenager. But his dad would get together with local businessmen and they would pray at different parts throughout the town there, different parts of the dairy farm that he owned. And they would say, God, won't you raise up somebody from our town to take this gospel message to the world? Won't you raise up somebody in our town to take this message, this good news, to the world, and they may know you like never before, but I can guarantee you that that dairy farmer probably had no idea that all those times that he saturated the soil with supplication, that the Almighty would raise up the very one they pray for in their midst, that it would come from his very own dairy farm. And because of that, and it is said that Billy Gray was about 15 years old one afternoon, and they chose the and doing the chores and the chores in the park. And there was a businessman that got up and he prayed a prayer like none other. A bold new prayer that they never prayed before. That God will raise up someone from Charlotte, North Carolina, that will take the gospel message to the ends of the world. What were they doing? They were saturating the soil with prayer. They were saying, God, we need you to move in such a mighty way. And it wasn't that they were just saying, I lay me down to sleep prayer. They were just praying one of those 10 cent prayers and expecting a million dollar answer. But time and time again, they would meet at different locations and say, God, pour out somebody from this town and send them to the world. They were saturating the soil with supplication. And we would go a little bit farther back in time to the time of the Reformation. There was a man by the name of John Knox. There's not much said about the ministry, the prayer life of John Knox in detail like there might be in the memoirs or the diaries of John Bunyan. But one thing we do know is that history records this, the famous words of John Knox, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. Those are not the common words of a common man that says a 10 cent prayer expecting a million dollar answer. But that is a cry of an individual that has saturated the soil with supplication saying, God, I need you to move like never before. God, I want you to use me like never before. And I'm sure time and time again, John Knox would find himself a place he could saturate the soil with prayer, where he could get along with God. And he, how do I know that? Because Mary, Queen of Scots, is said of Made this, said, made this statement, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies in Scotland and England. I've never said that about any, heard that said about any in the, all of history, that I pray their prayers more
more than all the armies of this country or all the armies of that country. What does that mean? That means that they knew that John Knox knew what it was to saturate the soil in prayer and get a hold of the throne room of God. And what he did, heaven didn't see him just as a guest, but they saw him as one of their own. And God looked down and said, you know what? He's my own son. And because I got to know him one on one, not from a distance, but he has saturated the soil and talked to me time and time again. And because of that, I will honor the prayers of John Knox. It is said that one day, a man go, has his land for less property for sale. And this man comes inquiring about the price. And the man says, that is this much. The man making the offer goes, I'll give you this much for the land. The landowner says, no, I could never accept the offer. That's way too low. The man says, okay. And he packs up and he leaves. Shortly after that, same man comes back. He goes, I'll give you this amount, lower than it was before. Man, the owner says, are you nuts? Are you crazy? If I didn't accept your last order, you really think I'm going to accept this order, this, this offer? You might as well get out of here. Third time, the man comes back with a much lower offer. They said, are you out of your mind? I didn't accept it the first two times. What makes you think I'm going to offer this lowest bid ever that you offer me? Man turns around to leave. As he's leaving, the owner, property owner goes, let me just ask you this. Who is the man making, who's the individual making the offer on the land? Who are you representing? He goes, I'm representing John Knox. He goes, and I'll accept your offer. Because I know if John Knox prays, I'll have to give him the land for free. You know what? There is something when the child of God saturates the soil in prayer that all of this hell takes notice. When the saints of God hits their knees, Satan and all his scoundrels scoundrel, stand at attention because they know that heaven takes notice. If we would know what it is to saturate the soil in supplication. If we would know what it is to hit our knees in prayer, how much would this world change for the better? In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, the Bible states, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they had assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Acts chapter 4. This is not the day of Pentecost. But rather, this was after the beatings. This was after the threatenings when John and Peter were on their way to the temple. This was after they were threatened by the religious leaders. They all assembled and said, God, give us Holy Ghost boldness. But they assembled with one mindset and one purpose. They saturated the soil so much in prayer that heaven took notice and the earth shook. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and 14 If my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their, heal their land. As Sister Beth comes to the piano, if the church, if the saints, would saturate the soil in prayer, how much would this world change? Billy Graham said, said, a mystery and wonder of prayer is that God often waits until someone asks. We had a pastor from Africa come to the Bible school while we were there. He preached an entire sermon on where prayer is the master key. We need to saturate the soil around us with supplication. As saints of the living God, we need to pray like never before. Around the 1950s and 1960s, 
There's a minister over on an island near Scotland. The young people weren't coming to church, and they tried everything they could to get them to come to church. There were two little old ladies, sisters, that came to him and said, Reverend, you have tried everything you can imagine to get these young people to church. But Reverend, have you tried God? Have you tried God? If you make it a point to pray, I think it was two days a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, me and my sisters, we will pray from this time to this time. And because of that, revival broke out on a small island called Louis. A revival that shut down the entire island. Where men and women, boys and girls, would just sit in fields during the day and talk about the presence of God that they feel. Where at one point, all the people in a town gathered at the prison because they knew that the constable was a God-fearing man. And they didn't know where else to go. Duncan Campbell describes the revival in great detail. It is a revival that after it had ended, the leaders of the church acknowledged that they didn't know what to do with it. And it died out. And secretly they would go meet at nights and weep over what they had lost. But it all began when two little old ladies said, you know what, Reverend, we'll saturate the soil with supplication with you. They had a niece that would later migrate to the United States. And she would bring forth a son. And one day, he would become president of the United States. I'm not saying that Donald Trump is a Christian. His language far speaks from it. But what I do know is he has a godly background. That if ever there was a time for the church to saturate the soil with prayer, now's the time. If ever there was a president that might go along with a move of God across this country, Probably now. But what is the church going to do? The church Bible does not say, and the heathen which are not called by my name, but it says, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and seek my face. What is that? That is saturating the soil with prayer. He would heal this land. Tonight, the church world needs to learn what it is to saturate the soil once again, to get a hold of God, to become praying men of God, men and women, to become a praying being, to turn this world right side up. The early church was not perfect. Paul wrote many letters of correction, but one thing they did know. That was to saturate the soil of prayer. A man's shadow does not pass by people and heal them without that individual being saturating the soil with prayer. Hails to God not get laid on the sick and the dead and raise them up from people who have not been saturating the soil in prayer. And history does not record this world being turned upside down unless men and women know what it is to saturate the soil of prayer. As we stand across this auditorium, it's not just a one-time thing here tonight, but it needs to be ingrained in our hearts, within our soul and within our mind. God, may we become a people with a desire, a passion, and a burden to saturate the soil with supplication. If that is your desire tonight, why don't we find ourselves at the place of the altar? And saturate.
Sow to the wind and you shall reap the whirlwind.